Once again, D-Lab Altered States here at Solid State Cinema. Today we're going to do something a little different. I have an amplifier that was purchased off of an auction site with a bad channel. But instead of going in here and being all scientific about it, we're going to shoot off the hip. See if we can guess what's wrong with the amp. Let's go. So here she is, the Realistic SA100 integrated amplifier. I hear that these were possibly made by Hitachi for Realistic or Radio Shack. Okay, here's the lineup of controls. You got your selector switch, which also has a phono input, very cool. Bass, mid range, treble. A lot of push buttons down there. My favorite of all, though, is loudness contour, right? Trouble, of course, you got balance and volume. These were a kind of a low end amplifier, kind of the entry level, but I'll tell you what, they sound great on a CD player. They make a very nice little shop amp, so hopefully I can repair it. The problem is, is one channel is low and distorted. It's not out, it just needs some help. Here's the backside of the Realistic SA-1000, also consider the model number 31-1980. If you remember, Radio Shack had these 31 dash numbers. They always had these funny catalog numbers for things, right? So this has this beautiful press board here, and you can see it was made in Japan for Radio Shack. You got two sets of speaker outputs, systems A and B, and what you have to be careful with when you hook up your speakers is you would normally think that this would be system A left and right, right, and then B. No, it's not that way. It's actually A left and right up and down and B left and right. So sometimes you get these things and you hook up your speakers and you have no output, you think you have a bad channel, but in reality, you just hooked up the wires incorrectly, right? So here's all of your inputs, all the RCA jacks, including the phonograph, and there is a switch for mag or, you know, a ceramic type cartridge. Of course, I'm not going to use it for that, but I just wanted to point out that it was a very full featured little amp. Let's give the Realistic uh, SA1000 a little test into the D-Lab stereo audio test set, and I'm going to monitor it with the Agilent scope, all right? So we'll flip around, give it a second for everything to be well. I'm going to bring up the volume, and let's take a look at the watt meters. You see we have output on both channels, right? Now let's take a look at the left channel. There's the output. Nice and clean, right? Looks good. Now let's flip our scope and monitor the right channel. This is the channel that has the distortion. So here we go. Bring her up. You can see it's clipped. Alright, so you'd initially think maybe that's a final output transistors. You can usually tell by putting your hand on the heat sink. Right now they're both running cool as a cucumber. But I haven't really worked the amp that much. So for the heck of it, let's compare the voltages between the left and right channel. Let's see what we got. All right, so for a quick check, we're just going to look at the collector voltages of the four output transistors. So we have the left channel here, the right channel here. They all run the original Toshiba 2SD371 transistors, which are NPNs, all right? So in this case, you would see your power supply, right? And on the next guy, you should see about half of that power supply if the output stage is balanced properly, and this one is. Now let's check the right channel. First transistoroid, there's a power supply. Next one, we're down to five volts, 5.5 volts. So that's not good. So there's some huge imbalance going on on the right channel, which is pretty obvious by the clip sine wave on the scope, all right? So the next thing that you'd wanna probably check is to make sure the biasing circuits are working and all that good stuff, which I will. However, since this isn't running hotter than a firecracker, I probably don't have a shorted output transistor. And if I did, it would probably pop the power fuse, which it's not. So my guess is it's probably all these old caps, 
We probably have some leaking capacitors. These old receivers and amps built in this day are famous for that issue. And if you think about it, if you got in here and let's say you did find a bad transistor and you replace that, what's the next thing you're going to do before you put this thing into service? You're going to recap it. So guess what? That's what we're going to do first. So you're probably thinking, well, geez, Terry, why don't you get in there and at least check for shorted transistors, open resistors, etc. Well, I would, except I see a signal on that scope, right? So I know that the amplifier is trying to work. My guess is, it's a gamble, that we got some bad caps. So I've made up a cap kit. There's not too many here. Here's the hit list. I happen to have all the proper type in stock. So first, I'm just going to change them. We'll recheck it. And if there's still a problem, then I'll attack it. But as you know, I work on a lot of tube amps. And what's the first thing you do on vintage tube amps? You recap them. So I'm going to follow that same strategy. So the amp has been on for about 5-10 minutes or so. And I do notice that the heat sink on this side is starting to get warm. But not bad. Okay. What's cool about this little amp is... You take out two screws on the heat sink, and then this whole board will lift right out for service. So one thing they did back in the day when they installed these caps is they put adhesive all along the bottom edges of them. So they may be a little bit difficult to get out, but not all the caps were glued down. So I have all the capacitors right now except for the main filter cap. And I don't suspect it is bad, but I will be changing it. But I expect we have a problem on the right stage here in one of these little guys. But we're just going to change all of these out. Replacing the caps is going to be a breeze. I just blocked this guy up to where he stands on his face vertically. Now I can get to the back of the board, just reach underneath, pop the caps out like teeth. So as I thought, because of this adhesive, I'm having a tough time getting this cap off the board. So I'm going to take an X-Acto knife, get under there, cut that adhesive, and see if she'll pop loose. Well, this cap is still fighting me. So I heard that if you take 100% alcohol and put that on the adhesive area, that the alcohol will get in there and attack the adhesive, and you should be able to remove the cap. So I'm going to give that a shot. All right, so I flooded the area pretty good. I'm going to let it sit. Start working this cap. And see if she'll break loose. Got to be very cautious, obviously, because I do not want to crack the board. But at this point, these caps have got to come off. Alright, looks like luck is with me. They're breaking loose. See it? It's moving. Alright. I think I'm in luck. I'm gonna... So this one is ready to come off the board. You can see it is breaking down that adhesive. It's a little bit tacky, so it's doing the job. Here's the other one. Look at that. Excellent. So they're off. I can clean off that adhesive because I really don't want to leave that behind. So now the adhesive is a little bit broke down. I'm just going to take a screwdriver just kind of push it off the board. I want to be very careful. I don't want to hit any of these components around here and chip them and cause more problems. Anyway, I'll get that cleaned up. But a story I wanted to share with you is the same type of adhesive that you see here, this yellow like rubber cement looking stuff. Sansui used to use that to glue all their components down on some of their circuit boards and it would actually attack the resistors and change their value and the Sansui's would start having issues because of that so on some of those I've had to actually strip the entire board down wash it off replace all the resistors to get those things to come back to life so they probably didn't have some guys that had like chemical engineering experience back there and that was a big boo-boo so I do not believe in putting adhesive on these boards. Remember, this is going to sit on your shelf and you're going to play music. It's not going to sit in a high vibration atmosphere, so you really don't need to glue down these components. Okay, the hard ones are changed. The old Caposauruses are out. 
replaced with these nice modern 2200s at 50 volts. Let's get the other ones done. Well, there's our dead soldiers. Changed out all the caps. I've got my meter set back up and we're going to look at those collector voltages again and see if the channels look the same. If so, it probably fixed it. All right. So here we go. Initial power up. Let's hope there's no smoke. I'm going to get right on here and measure these. So you can see our voltage now is up about three or four volts from what it was. Now this is a good channel. Yep. So you see that's up a little bit too. It was around 27 volts. Here's the other side. High side. There's that one. So looky there. That was five volts or like five and a half volts before, remember? Now it's kind of looking like the other channel. That's a very good sign. Let's throw a signal on it. Look on the scope. All right, another note, if you look at the preamp board, you'll see more of those old vintage caps, right? So if you're gonna do a real cap job, get those replaced too, because they also dry up and cause all kinds of fun in your preamp, like static pops and dropouts. All right, same deal. I have the receiver here powered up. Use an audio generator for my input. Look at these lights. Got the D-Lab audio test set and the meter. Now, I'm still on the right channel and that was the bad channel. So let's bring up the old volume, see what we get. Here we go to the scope. Remember, that thing was all clipped. A lot of distortion. Now look at it. All right, now let's flip over to the left. Bring our volume back up. You can see the watt meters doing their thing. Now this was the good channel initially. Same as the other. It appears as though the amp is fixed. So you can see I got kind of lucky on that repair, assuming that we had a bad cap, which we obviously do. Don't know which one. I'm really not concerned about it because I was going to change them anyway. So now I have the amp fired up and now we have a CD player hooked up to it so that we can hear how it sounds with music, right? Because that's a true test. So I'm going to bring up the volume. Now remember, I'm still in the D-Lab audio test set, right? So let's hit play on the CD player. And you'll see the watt meters doing their thing. There they are. Okay, let's look on the scope. You can see that music playing, but you can't hear it, right? That's because I've got the dummy load set at load and not speaker. So let's turn on the speakers and we'll be able to hear the SA-1000. Super cool, another vintage amp. All right, so obviously I'm gonna let this amp cook for a while. And yes, I am going to seek out a replacement main filter cap because I want a fresh one of those in there too. Now the schematic for the SA-1000 is available on the internet, but it's very difficult to read. So I have made a little blow up diagram of one of the channels with the voltages documented that I found on the original schematic. Of course, those are going to vary a little bit because our line voltage is higher these days. So as you saw, 
they show 50 volts for the input voltage but we're actually at 60 shows a center point voltage at 27.8 and we're over 30 and that's to be expected as long as this thing keeps running and that heat sink stays cool I'm good with it you know after this repair I've realized that solid state stuff isn't that bad after all I mean I got in there and said hey maybe soul's caps let's just change them out see what happens in this case it fixed it I'm very happy with that. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Solid State Cinema.